What's up everybody, welcome back. In today's video we're going to take a look at the player dying and what we're going to do after that. So uh, in this video we're going to set up returning to the main menu or respawning with a new character. And we're also going to make sure that the AI updates its target if the player that he's attacking is dying. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. Uh, I'm sorry the video is a little bit late. I'm still having a little bit of trouble with getting the project to work in standalone. I thought I had it fixed but the, uh, the problem returned. So that's taking up a little bit of time and I'm also working on another project on the side and that's going to be an uh, expansion of the multiplayer project that we can use to set up a multiplayer inventory. So I'm still working on it, it's not really done, but we can uh, pick up objects from the world and drop objects back into the world. And we can also uh, interact with chests and store objects inside of them and take objects from them. And everything will replicate and things will save. So uh, I'm working on the project, so I'm not sure when that's going to launch, but uh, that's coming as well. So if you like what I do and you want to support the channel, please check out my Kofi page or become a member on YouTube. Uh, you will get access to some premium channels in the Discord and you will get a YouTube membership badge and obviously my eternal appreciation. So uh, if you like what I do, please take a look into those options or just leave a like on the video. And you're also welcome to join the Discord if you want to ask a question about a video or just show off some projects that you made. So uh, let's just dive into today's video. So we're going to start inside of our base character and we're going to use our player controller for a little bit. So uh, in this case it's going to make sense to store it as a variable and we're going to do that inside of our multicast begin play event. So over here we already have a cast to our shooter player controller and we're going to pass it on to the multicast using an input. So let's select the event and create a new input and that's going to be the player controller. So that's a player controller variable. And then if we go a little bit up to event possessed, we can plug it into our multicast event begin play. So we can drag it off the pure cast and simply connect it up over here. And then we're going to use the input from the multicast event to plug into our cast over here. So that's the second cast after the is server check. So not the uh, uh, hero queen cast, but the multi, oh, come on, so the player controller cast. Uh, so we can get rid of this and then we're going to store this as a variable. So drag off here and promote to variable. And that's our shooter player controller. And we need to make sure that we select it and set it to replicate it and then plug the execution back in. So that should work. Oh, come on. There we go. And now that we have that set up, we can update our take damage event to start our dying. So we have our event uh, player take damage from the blueprint interface and we're going to change that so this event will only get called by the server so we're going to keep that in mind when we're setting things up over here um, first of all we're going to create a new variable and that's a boolean is alive and we want to make sure that we set the default to true so that if we spawn in we are actually alive and we also want to make sure that we set this to replicate it and then inside of our multicast or that's not a multicast inside of our interface event uh, first of all we're going to check if we are alive so we're only going to apply damage if we are actually alive so plug in the boolean into a branch and only continue from the true pin over here and with that setup i'm also going to add a clamp to the new uh, health variable over here so we're calculating the new health and i'm going to disconnect it from the setter and first i'm going to clamp the float so clamp float and i'm not really worried about the maximum so i'm just going to set that to a thousand or something so there may be uh, uh, something like power-ups or uh, special classes of players that have a, a higher amount of health so i do not really care about that i just want to make sure that i'm not going below zero 
Um, then I'm going to plug it back into the setter. And then we're going to change the next things up a little bit as well. So after the get damage direction, we're going to add a branch. So let's make a little bit of room over here. We're getting our damage direction and then we want to know if we are still alive or not. So first of all, let's check if our health is zero. So drag in our health variable and simply compare it. So if it's equal to zero, if that's false, we're going to continue the way we did. So we're going to get our hit montage. And if it's true, then we are actually dead. So first of all, we're going to set our is alive variable and set it to false. So we are the server. This will replicate. So all of the instances of my character will know I'm dead as well. And then we want to create a new uh, function to get our dead montage. So that's actually going to be similar to the hit montage function. So I'm just going to duplicate that one. And this is get dead montage. And first of all, let's set up the actual montages. So let's make sure that we can set them from the content browser over here. And if we go to our characters, heroes, and then mannequin animations, actions, there should be the dead animations inside of here. So I'm just going to set up the back, front, left, and right, one for each. So the first one is front, so I'm going to grab that front, the first one, and plug it in over here. Then we have back, left, and right, so back, plug it in, and then uh, left over here, and right over here. Um, so with that setup, let's continue working on the function first, so we can go back to the event graph. And then we can call our get death montage function. And we can also plug in the damage direction from the previous event call over here. Or function call, sorry, damage direction. And after that, we're simply going to use the multicast AI melee impact function to play our death montage. So this is simply a multicast event that plays an FX for the impact and then plays the uh, montage as multicast. So that works fine in this case. So let's simply call that over here as well. And this time we're going to plug in our dead montage and then get the location and the normal from the hit result all the way at the beginning. So that should work. Uh, let me double check my notes. What's the next step over here? So we want to add animation notifies to the dead montages to make sure that we have that out of the way as well. So let's compile our blueprint and close it down. So let's open up the montages and here we want to make sure that we add a new uh, notify so that we can start our rectal. So I'm just going to drag it to the end of the animation and somewhere over here I want to actually start my rectal. So then I'm going to go to the notify bar over here, right click, add notify and create a new notify. And then I can give it a name. So start ragdoll. And that should be good to go. So we want to do the same thing for all of the dead animations that we are using. So the uh, front one, the first one. So over here and then we can simply right click add notify and then we already created it. So we have a skeleton notify over here and we can select our start ragdoll. So add it to all of the animations or montages that you are using. So over here right click add notify skeleton notify start ragdoll and for the right one as well. Start ragdoll. So with those set up, uh, we need to go into our animation blueprint to make sure this uh, notify actually does something. And we're going to call an event on our character. So first of all, let's create the event on the character so that we can actually call it. So inside of our event graph, create a new custom event. And I'm going to call it start rectal. And we're going to get back to this a little bit later. First, I'm going to go into my animation blueprint 
and then inside of the event graph we can add a new notify event so right click add animation notify event and then the start ragdoll and then we can simply drag in our character that we have stored as a variable and we can call our start ragdoll event and plug this in so the animation blueprint runs on all instances of the character so this will kind of behave like a multicast event and this will also execute on all instances of the character so there's no need to replicate anything inside of our start ragdoll event over here um, so we're going to continue setting up this event inside of our player character So let's finish up the start ragdoll event and as I mentioned it's kind of a multicast event so we do not need to worry about replicating in here. So first of all we're going to drag in our capsule component and we're going to set the collision. So set collision enabled and we're going to uh, set it to no collision. So plug it in and the next thing we want to do is drag in our character mesh and then we want to set the collision profile by name so set collision profile name and for the collision profile name we want to set it to ragdoll so that's with a capital R and two L's at the end ragdoll and then we want to drag off the mesh again and we want to set all bodies below to simulate physics so set below simulate physics and then you want to set all bodies below simulate physics so this one and we want to set the new simulate to true and include ourselves and then for the bow name i'm going to make a literal name and we're going to use the pelvis bone so that's without any capitals so just like this and then we can choose to add an impulse to the mesh as well so if we drag off the mesh again we can add impulse and then for the bone name we can plug in our pelvis bone again so drag off the literal name and simply plug that in over here and then we can get our character movement component and we're going to get the velocity from the last update so get update last velocity and we're going to normalize this vector and then we're also going to multiply this vector so drag off again multiply and over here you can define how much force you want to apply so i'm going to keep it a little bit low and something like uh, 150 150 and just a little bit upwards so maybe 30 and then we're going to add these two vectors together again and we can simply plug them into our impulse and we want to make sure that we set it to a velocity change so we get a little bit more constant behavior and that should work so we have our rectal set up and this will execute with the animation notify so as soon as we play our that animation over here at the end of the animation we're gonna turn into a rectal um, now I want to set up a camera target so the camera actually changes position when we die and we can simply use our camera target that we already created for the lobby characters so if we go to the viewport select our character and we're going to add a component and that's a child actor and then uh, let's give it the proper name first so that's going to be our camera target that and over here on the right side for the child actor class we're gonna set it to our camera target blueprint so we created this earlier in the tutorial series for the lobby characters if you're interested in that so we have our camera view target blueprint and that's basically just an empty blueprint with an arrow component so we can see where it's at um, so we need to set this up so I'm gonna drag it up into the sky and then a little bit backwards and make it face down so that's minus 90 over here and then i'm also going to set the uh, rotation for the roll to minus 180 so that will give it a little bit more flare when it's changing positions um so that's about 
it, I think. Maybe move it up a little bit more. So that's fine. Compile and save. And then we can go back into the event graph. And over here uh, in the multicast event, we're actually going to continue after playing the montage. So let me grab my notes quickly. So first of all, let's add a branch over here and check if we are alive. So let's grab our new boolean. So if we are still alive, we're not going to do anything special. But if we are not alive, we want to do some stuff for the local player. So we're going to drag in another branch. And then we're going to check if we are locally controlled. So we're uh, actually running this from a multicast event. So this runs on all instances of the player. So that's an easy way to continue. And we're simply going to filter out only the local player and then uh, update some HUD stuff and things like that. So right now we're going to drag in our new player controller reference that we created at the beginning of the video. And first of all, we're going to disable the input. So drag off here, disable input. And we can simply use the normal disable input uh, function. And we do not need to use our event that we created earlier in the series. Uh, we do need, need to make sure that we switch the player controller over to the lower pin and the target is the actual pawn. So that's stealth. And we want to continue from the true pin over here. So with the input disabled, we're going to set the new view target. So we're going to drag off the player controller again and set view target with blend. Plug it in. And for the view target, we're actually going to use our child actor component. So drag in our camera target for that. And from here, we need to drag off and get the actual child actor. And we can use that to plug in the new view target. So we cannot plug in a component over here. We need to get the actual actor. So that's what we're doing over here. And then we can set the blend time. So I'm going to set it to something like two seconds. So we have a nice smooth blend going on. And then uh, what we're going to do next is make sure that we disable our tick event. So let's drag off here and set actor tick enabled and set this to false. So if we're going to look what this is doing, we are the locally controlled player. And over here, we are actually only running tick for the local player. That's what we're doing in our begin play. And inside of tick, we're changing our uh, set use desired controller uh, rotation. And we do not want to mess with this when we are dying. So we're going to disable that. And then we're going to simply set this as well. So we can copy this part over here, switch has authority with the uh, setters. So let's copy this and then go back down. Go back to our multicast for the animation. And after we disabled our event tick, we're going to check if we are the server or the client. And then we want to make sure that we get rid of these is, uh, is moving getters. And we're going to simply set this to false. And then uh, that should be good to go as well. So I think with this setup, we can have a little test and our rectal with the camera stuff should be working. And after that, we're going to take a look at setting up the menu and actually respawning or returning to the main menu. So multiplayer session launched. Let's have a little look if our rectal is working. So I'm going to check the client and then if this is working, we're going to assume for now that the server is working as well. We can test a little bit more later. I should have increased the damage for the AI, but okay. So I'm actually dying, but I am not going into Ragdoll or at least the animation was playing. So the notify didn't fire, I think. So let me double check and I'll get back in a little bit. Okay, I don't think we actually did something wrong here, but when we migrated our character from the Lyra starter game, it actually didn't migrate the physics asset. 
So uh, we could choose to uh, generate one from scratch, but that usually doesn't give the greatest results. So I've opened the Libra starter game project and I'm going to migrate the physics asset. So it's inside of the character, heroes, mannequin, and then rig folder. You have the PA mannequin, that's the physics asset. So I'm going to right click and migrate it. So that's asset action migrate. And it's going to bring up a whole list, but I do not want any of this stuff, to be honest. So I'm going to disable everything except for the actual physics asset itself. And that should be over here in the rig folder, PA mannequin. So we want to disable everything else inside of that folder. And then we can simply disable all of the other folders. So over here and this one as well. So this stuff, we do not need any of this as well. We already have it. So that should be good to go. So now only our physics asset is selected. Click OK. And we're going to migrate it into our own project. So that should be good. And now we need to go inside of our meshes folder and actually assign our physics asset. So let's select our uh, mesh. And then in the asset details over here, we can select our physics asset. So set it to PA mannequin. And now that should work. Uh, you do need to keep in mind that you do need to set it up for each mesh separately. So I'm going to pause the video and set uh, all of the message uh, physics assets and then I'll be back. So with the actual physics asset in place, let's have a little look if the rectal is working this time. So there we go, we're going down and we are actually going into rectal and the camera transition is working as well. So that uh, seems to be working. Now let's have a look at setting up the player diet menu so we can choose what we want to do next. So return to the main menu or respawn our character. So first of all, we need to create a widget so we can show that to the player. So I'm going to duplicate the pass menu because there's actually some functionality in there that we can reuse. So let's duplicate this one and I'm going to call it player diet menu. So in here uh, we can kind of keep this for now. First of all let's change the text over here. So I'm going to change it to you are dead. And that's good to go. Now for the vertical box over here I'm going to right click it and I'm going to replace it with a horizontal box. So now we have the buttons next to each other in, uh, instead of on top of each other. And then I'm going to grab the border again and I'm going to resize it. So I'm going to make it uh, 750 by 55. And then I'm going to anchor it to the center of the screen and make sure that it's actually centered. So alignment 0.5 and that should work. Let's set this one to 0.5 as well. Now we have some spacers in here and we can set them up. So if we switch the uh, size around so make it 25 and the other one is going to be one and then do the same thing for the other spacer and then that should pretty much work so we can resize the border a little bit there we go so for the border i'm gonna give it a proper name so that's going to be my border default buttons and then I'm going to make sure that it's a variable. So on the top right over here, enable is variable. Um, so let's set up the actual buttons. So for the resume game button, I'm going to change it into the spectate button. So I'm going to say spectate game. And we're going to set this one up in the next video. But make sure that we change the actual button as well. So button spectate. And then we have one for the main menu and we can simply keep that one and the other one is going to be respawn the character. So I'm just going to say respawn and change the actual button. So button respawn. And then uh, we need to resize the border again. So I think the 750 was pretty much on point. Well, that should do. 
and make sure it's centered so there we go um, so by default this border is visible and then I'm going to create a second border so let me grab my notes quickly um, so let's simply drag it on top of the screen and for this border I'm going to set it to uh, 550 by 225 so that's the size and then again I'm going to anchor it to the center of the screen and make sure the alignment is 0.5 so it's actually centered so maybe we want to raise this one a little bit that should work so i'm going to make the brush color black and then a little bit transparent and in here uh, first of all i'm going to drag a vertical box so let's go to our panel section and grab a vertical box inside of our border and in there i want to add some text so i'm going to copy the font over here copy it and paste it to the new one make sure the color is set as well so why are my colors not saved anymore that's weird okay So there we go. So over here, uh, I want to say you are the host. If you quit the game, it will end for all players and then quit to the main menu anyway. So let's change the text first. Um, you are the host. If you quit, the game will end for all players. Quit game anyway question mark so now this doesn't match up so after d over here we're gonna hit shift enter to create a new line and that looks a little bit better so let's uh, set the visibility for this border to hidden so we can see a little bit better what we are doing now below this uh, text i want to add a horizontal box so let's drag that inside of our vertical box and inside of the horizontal box i want to add two buttons so i'm going to grab my respawn button and copy it and then to the horizontal box and paste it and then paste it again and these are simply my yes and no buttons so uh, let's set up the left one for yes so that's my button yes and for the text yes and then i'm going to set the minimal desired width to 100 and center the text and for the button i'm going to set it to fill and then to the left side and the other one is going to be button no so the text is going to be no and then minimal desired width 100 center the text and align the button to the right it already is but whatever so we're gonna grab this border and we're gonna call this our border pop-up are you sure and we need to make this a variable as well and by default we're gonna set this border to hidden so we have the designer part set up now we can get the other border back into the visibility so this is our widget now let's have a look at setting up the graph so let's open up the graph and we have stuff in here from the pause menu so let's get rid of the stuff we don't need so this is the button spectate we can simply delete all of that for now and for this one we have the button respawn that we're going to delete as well and the button main menu we're going to keep this one uh, only at the end over here we are casting to our uh, shooter game instance and then set our pause menu visible so we don't need to do this part so let's delete it and then hook up the connection pins over here so now we can get rid of the shooter game instance variable as well because we're not going to need that over here and then we want to set up an event construct so let's do that first so event construct and in this case we're going to get our owning player so that's the actual player controller 
or this widget. So we're going to cast it to our shooter player controller. And we're going to promote this to a variable. So that is good to go. And then uh, for the event for the main menu button over here. So if we are the server, we want to make sure that we show the pop up. So let's disconnect the true pin first. Then we're going to grab in both of our borders. So we have the border default buttons and the border pop up. Are you sure? So we're going to set the default buttons to be hidden. So set the visibility and simply set it to hidden. And for the other border with the are you sure text, we're going to set that to visible and plug everything in. So now we can only uh, click our yes and no buttons and the other buttons are gone. So if we add on clicked event for those, so button no on clicked event and button yes on clicked event. And then we can simply hook up our yes button back to the uh, previous execution pin, so the cast to the shooter game mode. And if we click the no button, we want to uh, set the borders visibility back the other way around. So we can simply copy and paste this and then switch the hidden and visible. And now we have our default menu back. So that should be good to go for returning to the main menu. And now for the host, there should be a little pop up to make sure that he knows what he is doing. Um, so I think with this setup, we need to go inside of our shooter player controller to make sure that we actually uh, display this widget when we are dying. So I'm going to grab my notes on the side quickly. So let's open up our shooter player controller. And in here, I'm simply going to create a new function to show the new uh, widget. So let's create or actually we can duplicate our UI show in game HUD function. And I'm going to call it a UI show player died menu. So in here, let's get rid of the actual HUD references. And then we want to create our player died menu. And with this setup, we can create a new variable for this one as well. So that's our widget blueprint player died menu. And then hook everything back up the way it was. So we need to hook our player died menu into the add to viewport node and also into the is valid check over here. And then I want to do a few other things in here as well. So we're going to add a little bit more room. And then first we're going to set our input mode to UI only. So set input mode uh, UI only. And we need to plug in a player controller for this to work. So you actually need to drag off here and type in self or this doesn't work. So we can leave the widget empty. That doesn't really matter. And then we also want to show our mouse cursor. So set show mouse cursor. And that's a variable on the player controller. So we can set it directly and set this to true. So with this set up, we need to make sure that we actually call this event and we're going to do this uh, inside of the multicast event in the hero base character. So let's open up our hero base character. And if we go into the multicast event where we are playing the dead animation, so we're checking if we are locally controlled. And after we set our view target with blend, we can drag off the player controller over here and call our UI show player died menu. So I'm going to hook it up right after the set view target. And then that should work as well. Um, so I think we can have a quick test in game. And then if this is working, we're going to set up respawning the character. So I'm launching the multiplayer session and let's see if this is working or not. So we're going to test with the client again. And uh, at the end of the video, we're going to test with the host. So we have the menu over here. Uh, all we can do right now is go to the main menu. So let's see if that's working. And it seems to be working. 
So we kind of need to make sure our session is destroyed. So if we go back to multiplayer and search a new session. So let's see if we can actually find sessions again. And that's working. So our previous session is destroyed. So that's good news. And we have this part of the widget set up. So now let's set up uh, respawning the character. And then at the end of the video, we're going to test with the server. So to respawn our character, we're going to start on the game mode. So we're going to go to the shooter game mode. And in here, I'm going to create a new custom event and I'm going to call it respawn after dying. So custom event, uh, respawn after dying. So in here, we pretty much want to do uh, what we are doing over here. So we're going to grab all connected player controllers, find player start and the conversion node over here. And then we can paste that down here. Now, what I would ideally want to do is simply call this function spawn default pawn 4. But this function is not blueprint callable and I do not want to start messing with C++ in this tutorial. So what we're going to do is simply create a new version of this function that we can call in blueprints. So we're going to copy all of these in between the input and the return node, copy it. And then create a new function and I'm going to call that a uh, respawn pawn for controller. So respawn pawn for controller. And in here, I'm simply going to paste everything again. Now, first of all, we can hook this up to the input node. And for the variables over here, we can simply right click them and create a local variable. So I'm going to do that for all three of them over here. So these are local variables that should be working at the end. Uh, we can leave this alone. That's good. So we actually spawn in with the correct model and skin for the character as well. Now for the inputs, we need to make sure that we uh, match them up with the previous function. So over here, we need a player controller and an actor. So let's create an input and that's the player controller. So in our case, we can simply add our shooter player controller. And then for the second one, that's a reference to the player start. And that's actually just an actor. So call it player start and then turn it into an actor variable. So the player controller needs to be plugged in directly into the struct over here. And then we can get rid of the cast. So we can delete the cast node and then plug this back into the false pin. And we can also plug the player controller uh, uh, directly into the target pin over here. And we do need to keep the cast to the player state. So that's fine. And then for the player start, we need to make sure that we plug this into the actor transform. So we actually spawn at the correct position. And this function should be pretty much good to go. There's only one thing I want to do, but uh, to do that, we need to open up our base character first. So let's go into side of our base character. And in here, I'm going to create a new variable and call that uh, death respawn. And then compile it. And with the variable in place, let's go back to the shooter game mode and drag off the cast to the hero base. And we're going to set our death respawn variable to true. So get a setter and make sure that we set it to true over here. And then uh, we want to grab a return node and make sure that we return the actual pawn as well. So we're going to add an output. And let's double check. So the output is a pawn reference so i'm going to call this new pawn and then change it into a pawn a variable type so move it all the way back over here and make sure that we grab the return value from the spawn actor from class and we're going to plug it into the return node uh, Okay, so maybe grab a new return node. What the actual, okay. Um, well, okay. 
and then we can plug in the return from the cost so uh, that should be better so grab the return from the cost the return value over here doesn't work because we are plugging in a variable so it doesn't know what actor it's spawning um, so with this setup that's good to go and now we need to go inside of our player controller to set up the rest so let's open up our shooter player controller and in here i'm going to create a new function or a new event actually so let's right click create custom event and i'm going to call it restart after that or probably respawn after that that's better so this function is going to be called from our player controller that belongs to the hut and that's our local player controller so we need to make sure that we replicate this to run on the server side player controller and if we do that then we can actually get our game mode so let's get game mode and we're gonna cast it to our shooter game mode and from here we can simply call our uh, respawn after dying event and we do need to make sure that we actually feed in our player controller as a variable to the event so let's go back into the game mode and we want to go back into the event graph because we didn't actually set this up yet so let's uh, select the event and we need an input over here and that's our player controller and that's our shooter player controller so with this setup uh, we can drag off all the connected players and we're going to find this player controller and the result of this find we're going to plug it into this node over here so we know what player start to look for and we also need to plug in the player controller into the find player start node and then with that setup we can actually uh, unpossess our current pawn so oh, oh my notes are totally screwed up really there we go so um, we can drag off the player controller over here and unpossess our current pawn and then we can call our respawn on for controller function that we just created and we're going to plug in our player controller from the event and the player start from the find player start function and then from the new pawn we can drag off the player controller again and we can look for possess and then we can simply plug in the pawn so that's the new pawn that we want to possess now you don't actually need to unpossess it first if you have a pawn possessed well while you call possess it will automatically unpossess it but uh, just to show you you can do it manually as well so you have unpossess and possess nodes so with this setup uh, we can compile and save and then go back to the shooter player controller so now we can plug in a reference to ourselves over here and there's one thing i want to do uh, as well on the player controller and that's create the death respawn variable so let's create a boolean and that's death respawn and then we're going to set this to true over here so we know we are respawning instead of the actual initial spawn and with that variable in place we can go a little bit up to the event possess and we actually possess a new pawn so this will be called again and we are setting our local hut variables so if we look what we are doing casting to the base character and then update the health bar so that's all good because we are actually possessing a new pawn so all of this is uh, fresh and we need to make sure that all of the information on our pawn is up to date so we can go uh, from the event on possessed and over here add a little branch and then check if this is our dead respawn or not and if it is we are going to set this back to false first and then we're simply going to call our uh, begin play but we want to call this as a multicast event so we're going to create a new custom event and call this multicast begin play make sure that we set this to uh, multicast and then reliable and then also plug it in over here 
So keep the normal event we can play and just add this one to it. And then go back to the event on possessed. And from here, we're going to call our multicast we can play. So event possessed only executes on the server. So uh, the server will call this and then event we can play will execute on all of our instances. So uh, that's set up as well. And now uh, let's go back into our base character because we added the death respawn boolean and we want to do a few small things with that. So first of all, let's go to the event graph event possessed. And in here, uh, we are disabling the input if we are spawning the first time because we have the countdown and we are setting up a few things. But with the dead respawn, we actually do not want to do that. So I'm just going to grab a branch and plug that right in between here. Check if this is a dead respawn or not. So first, I'm going to set the variable back to false if it is true. And then I'm simply going to skip the disable all input node and directly call multicast begin play. And if it's false, I'm going to disable all input and then continue like we did before. And in the actual event begin play, we have a delay of two seconds over here and we don't really need that anymore. So what I'm going to do is change it to 0.3 seconds. And the reason for that is because we have a delay of 0.2 in the player controller somewhere over here to set up the local head variable and this only uh, needs to be here to work in the play and editor mode so if we are doing a standalone build we can get rid of this delay and then also get rid of the delay in the character and that should be good so we need to make sure that we set this up a little bit longer than this delay over here otherwise we do not have a hut to work with so change this one to 0.3 and we should be good to go and then all we need to do is go inside of our widget blueprint and call an unclicked event for the button. So let's go into our player diet menu. And we're going to add an unclicked for the respawn button. And all we need to do in here is grab our player controller and we can simply call our respawn after that function. So we're calling this with our local player controller that could be the server or the client. We're making sure that we are replicating to the server. The server can get the game mode and then call the respawn after dying function. This will spawn the new pawn and then make sure that everything possesses and everything will be reinitialized. So uh, I think we are good to go. We're going to test this. And if this is working, uh, all we need to do is make a few small changes to the AI. So that will update its target when the player died. So multiplayer session launching. Let's check the server this time. So we should be able to respawn from the menu. So we are dying. Let's click the respawn button. And we have a new character spawning from the start position. We have our health bar back to 100. We actually have all weapons. So everything seems to be working. So that's cool. Now let's make sure that the AI updates its target when the player dies as well. So it's not a whole lot we need to do inside of our AI. So let's open up the base AI character. And first of all, let's go into the event graph to the attack loop function. So look for the attack loop that's over here. And let's make sure that we have a little bit of room to work with. So over here, before the branch, I'm going to add uh, another branch. And in here, I'm going to drag in my target player and make sure that my target player is alive. So get our is alive boolean. And we can plug that into this branch. So if this is true, we're going to continue. If this is false, we are going to set our can attack boolean to false first. So plug that in over here. And uh, then we can drag in our player, uh, sorry, AI controller. We're not a player. And from the AI controller, we can set our can switch targets boolean. So make sure that we set this one to true. And we also want to drag uh, no, we don't need the controller. We can grab the character movement component and then drag off here and stop our movement immediately. So that will make sure that the current movement loop 
uh, will be aborted. So over here we have our move loop and this is actually continuing to loop but we set our character move speed to zero. So if we stop movement immediately it will call the aborted pin and this will break out of the loop. So otherwise we have the loop running two times. And then uh, we can go a little bit up over here and we can grab the set default walk speed for the character movement component and plug that in over here as well. And the next thing we want to set is our target player. So we're going to drag that in and make sure that we clear the target player because it's no more uh, alive. It's no more alive. That's not good English, but you know what I mean. So we want to clear the target player. And then the last thing we want to do is call our on AI spawn function. So call that over here. And that's not a function, that's an event. And we're going to go to that event because we need to make a few small changes. So we have the on AI spawn. And in here we are looking for an enemy. And we're going to open up this function because we want to make sure that we are only uh, picking an enemy that's alive. So in the beginning over here, let's make a little bit of room. And I am actually going to use the local array. So I'm not sure if I did this on video or not, but you want to uh, promote this to a local variable. So we have an array for all of the players. And then from here, we're going to drag off and I'm going to look for a reversed for each loop. And then we're going to use the reversed for each loop to loop through all of our players. So let's plug that in over here. And from here for the array element, we want to get our is alive boolean. And then we're going to grab a branch, plug it into the loop body. So if we are not alive, we want to remove this item from the array. So we're going to drag off the array element and call remove item. And hook this up to the false pin. So if we are not alive, we want to remove ourselves from the array. So plug in the local all players array. And the reason I'm using a reversed for each loop is because we are removing uh, indexes from the array. So if I would start at zero, remove this index, then index one will become index zero. But my uh, normal for loop will be continuing at index one. So then I'll be missing out on some indexes. So if we are removing stuff, uh, it's usually better to grab a reverse for each loop. And then uh, we are actually removing indexes from the top and then working our way down. So that way it doesn't matter if we are removing an index. So uh, with this in place, we can complete and simply plug that into our branch over here. And we want to make sure that we do plug in the local player array over here. So if the array is not empty, we're going to continue like we did before. And with that setup, I think we have the AI pretty much good to go as well. So let's check that out. And then we are done for today's video. So the new session is launching. Let's have a little look how this is going. So we should be able to die, respawn, and the AI should be chasing me. So that's working. That's cool. So now if I would respawn with the other character, I'm starting at the start position again. And if the AI's target is dead, he's going to switch to me again. So that's cool. That seems to be working. Now if I am the client, I should be able to just go to the main menu if I'm dead. So let's see if that's working as well. So I'm going to go to the main menu, the host can continue playing so I can respawn and then the AI is going to attack me again and then I'm going to see what happens. Uh, okay, that's a little failure because this is actually still a pawn and it's getting noticed by the AI perception component. So that's why he switched targets to a dead player and we need to make sure that we catch that as well. Uh, we're going to do that in the next video and I actually know that returning to the main menu for the host is working with a little pop-up so I'm not going to bother, bother testing that right now. Um, if there's any issues I'll make sure to tackle them in the next video first thing like usually. 
So that's the video for today. If you enjoyed watching, please consider leaving a like. And also, if you look forward to the multiplayer inventory tutorial, uh, make sure that you mention it in the comments. So that way I'll know you are interested in that as well. So thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, talk to you later. Bye bye.